There's another moon landing coming soon. Find out more in today's episode. Three, two, one, and in full power. Welcome to Your Space Journey, where we venture into the future of space exploration. Your journey begins now. Hello, thanks for joining me today for Your Space Journey. My name is Chuck, and today we'll be diving into the company Intuitive Machines and how they plan to put a lander on the moon. Intuitive Machines is a Houston-based company that designs and manufactures advanced spacecraft for government and commercial customers. Founded in 2013 by Dr. Tim Crane, a respected engineer and entrepreneur with over 20 years of experience in the aerospace industry, the company has quickly established itself as a leader in the field of space exploration and technology. With a focus on reliability, innovation, and cost effectiveness, Intuitive Machines is committed to advancing humanity's understanding of the universe and expanding our capabilities in space. Dr. Crane, who serves as the company's chief technical officer, is an expert in the design and operation of spacecraft and has played a key role in the development of many of the company's most innovative and ambitious projects. Your space journey. Tim, thank you so much for joining me today. Glad to be here, Chuck. Well, it is a pleasure to have you. You have a fascinating background in the space industry, you know, PhD in aerospace engineering, uh, entrepreneur, great engineer. Um, I understand that even a personal goal of yours is enabling future s- space exploration. I was just wondering if you could tell us a little bit more about um, your background and how your passion for space began. Yeah, you know, it's um, I'm the kind of person who's caught between two worlds. Because on, on one hand, um, as evidenced by getting a PhD, I really want to get down and deep into the technical nitty gritty and understand where the hard problems are and have my hands on the wheel to solve those problems, right? Um, on the other hand, I also want to look at the horizon and shape architectures, and influence decisions. Right. And those don't always balance out. So, you know, sometimes... You have to go heads down to work with technical solutions, and uh, sometimes you have to rise up and, and look across the, the landscape and inform architecture at a much broader level than necessarily, say, tuning the gains in your C code for a Kalman filter on a flight software for a lunar lander. And uh, so that's kind of been the, the yin and yang of my career is I'm, I'm very technically interested in problems that are presented from space exploration, and I, and I love solving those problems. Um, but I also really enjoy putting together architectures at a macro level along the lines of, hey, what if we put this lander with this micro hopper? And what if we put this navigation pod with this communication satellite? And how might, might we architect things to get new capabilities? So that's that's kind of the, the meta level of my career so far, but uh, the details are, I got a PhD in aerospace engineering from the University of Texas at Austin. Uh, then I came to the Jonathan Space Center in 2000 and was a civil servant for 13 years working in advanced mission concepts and um, was the first orbit GNC lead for the Orion vehicle uh, for a number of years and then worked on the Morpheus project, which was an experimental lunar lander. And uh, your listeners should go to YouTube and, and go after uh, NASA Morpheus Project. There's really some great videos of us doing terrestrial testing, um, both here at JSC and at the Kennedy Space Center. Oh my gosh, that really went- that's incredible. Yeah, I'm sorry, I just had to interrupt because, yeah, I had heard about that project a little bit. I'm going to try to put a link in the show notes yeah. for this, too. That's amazing that you're a part of that. That would be fascinating. Yeah, and it really, you know, we were working on that kind of at the same time that SpaceX was growing um, through the Falcon 9, you know, from the Falcon 1 to the Falcon 9. And it seemed like a team of people doing incredible things. And we were working the Morpheus Project, and we kind of had a small team of people doing what we thought was an incredible thing. Um, and it whetted my appetite for, hey, let's get motivated teams of um, technically skilled, passionate people together and see what we might do. And that was kind of the impetus for, for starting Intuitive Machines in 2013. Well, see, that's a perfect segue because I have to admit, I love your company's statement right on your website. Um, it says, we open access to the moon for the progress of humanity. 
Very profound. I love it. I, I think it's fantastic that Intuitive Machines has been awarded three lunar missions, more than any contractor, I believe, any other contractor. Um, why were there? Tell us more about Intuitive Machines and its mission. So Steve Ultimus, um, Cam Gaffering, and myself founded Intuitive Machines in mm -hmm. 2013. And, and really, the, the vision at the time was there were so many great capabilities within the engineering disciplines used in human spaceflight that we had worked with at the Johnson Space Center. That we thought that those could also be brought out and, and be applied to still aerospace, but also the biomedical sector um, and the energy sector. And being in Houston, you know, of course, we have the Johnson Space Center, but we also have the Texas Medical Center, which is the largest medical center in the world. Um, and Houston, no surprise, anybody is a, is a hub for energy technology and, mm -hmm. and business. So we felt like that was a, a good place at the time to, to start a think tank and bring those ideas and try to tackle those tough problems. We weren't going to the moon at the time. It was moon was kind of in the, in the backwash of uh, NASA's plans. And so it seemed like a good time to maybe try something else. But in 2018, moon, the moon came back into favor in a big way. And, and the Eclipse program was established. And we said, well, let's give that a try. Let's see if we can get into the program. And then we did. And we started developing our technology. In fact, we started developing our technology for the program before we got into the program. Um, we were so excited about it. And then within a year, we completely pivoted the company and shed our original think tank um, motif and really are all in on the moon and being that, that transportation and infrastructure. And, and if you think about it, prior to the CLIPS program, if you wanted to do science on literally on the moon or, and maybe even an order on the moon, you had to have a dedicated mission. You had to be a PI who had um, won a major you know, competition for a full mission all the requirements flowed down and everything was geared towards executing that one mission. The promise of a commercial lunar access is, well, what if you're a scientist with a, with a great idea for a 10 kilogram experiment? And, and maybe that 10 kilogram experiment by itself doesn't warrant full booster purchase and, and, and uh, lander mission and, and payload integration and the comms network and the operations and all the things that go with it. But what if we could do a ride share where you could be a part of a lander that's taking multiple payloads to execute multiple experiments or um, commercial endeavors at the moon? That really appeals to us to then provide that. And, and I really have to give it to NASA, the way that program up. Their stature, this kind of NASA is one customer, and maybe not even the primary customer. And if a university or a research institution or even a private has a payload and they just need a part of a lunar mission, we can now provide that at a scale that allows that person to focus on what's important to them, their science, their experiment. And it, it's a whole new way of thinking about it. Tim, let me ask you this, because I, I I have a just a real great respect for startups. And I, I know that in easy. I have some friends who, who who've done them. And I have to admit, that takes a lot of courage. Um, you you led into some of your entrepreneurial spirit with the ride share you mentioned. But what were some of the biggest challenges that you faced um when you were starting up? Well, as a as a rocket scientist. Um, and then as a NASA civil servant, there were a lot of times where the elegance and the uh, applicability of a, of a technical solution kind of had its own merit. You know, hey, here's an engine where we can increase the efficiency of this engine. And, and if we increase the efficiency of this engine, we can deliver more payload for this scientific endeavor. And, and you know, those kind of thoughts within the agency uh, we carry a lot of weight, and we go, great, yeah, let's go invest in that. Well, now when you come out and you're a private company and you're an entrepreneur, the, the technical elegance and sophistication of a solution is not enough by itself to generate revenue. So understanding that the things we develop have to then be sold or provide a service in their own right and that, you know, is, is any... 
uh, NBA would tell you, your product and your cost have to match your revenue. Changing that thinking to go, look, it's not enough to have a great technical solution all the all um, that solves a real problem. If as a company, you can't connect that to customers who are going to you know, pay um, for that. And that was, that was just something that, you know, I guess we kind of knew it from, from high school business math. Um, but to live that reality of there is no, um, you know, omnibus spending bill that's funding our company. We have to find ways to provide goods and services that the customers, whether in our think tank mode or, or to the space program, are interested in. For, for rocket scientists coming out of the civil service, that was a little bit of a notion. But I, I think it's incredible. And I'm just, I'm sitting here, coming to fruition now is the IM1 mission. Schedule launch not too far from now involves placing a lander called Nova Sea near the South Pole of the Moon. I think that's awesome. Can you tell us a little bit more about the IM1 mission and what it aims yeah. to accomplish? Absolutely. Nova Sea was um, our first lander design. And, and as part of that, we we tried to have have a, a first cut at where do we think the market would be? <laughs> Going back to those nervous, sweaty right. palms days, figuring out how to, how to actually make money at what you do as a craft. Um, we felt like 100 kilograms landed payload would be a nice sweet spot for the early stage of this lunar economy. The designing a lander that could put five metric tons, you know, on the moon, we just didn't feel like there was five metric tons of commercial payload to land early on. So we, we, we restrained ourselves and we said, let's try to land 100 kilograms. And that's where the C in Nova C came from. So, okay. And actually we land 130 kilograms. So we overachieved a little bit. But uh, it is a liquid oxygen, liquid methane engine. It's a cryogenic engine. So um, we have a very energetic uh, capability to decelerate when we get to the moon. So we, we take off um, from the booster, we separate shortly after launch, and then it's a short three-day transit to the moon. And then we perform a lunar orbit insertion, which is about a third of our delta V. And really, it, it looks like stopping on a dime when you look at the trajectory at a, uh, at a Earth moon scale. And now we're in a lunar orbit. We orbit for a day or two, we make sure all the systems are checked out, and then we perform a power descent all the way to the surface. And our engine is a throttleable engine, so we begin at, at very near max thrust for the early part of the power descent. And then we pitch over and we throttle down. So we leave the engine on from the time we start power descent all the way to touchdown. We throttle down, throttle down. It's a very gentle ride. There's no bang, bang control. It's a gimbal engine that steers. We land, we touch down softly. That profile uh, is very reminiscent of Apollo. It's no surprise given that I can see the Johnson Space Center um, here from my window that we'd be influenced by the Apollo program, how they, they approach their landing. Once we land, um, we become a power and data hub for our payloads, whether they remain attached to the vehicle and um, all but one of them on IM-1 do remain attached to the vehicle. But we are the power and data hub for, for their operations once we're on the surface and bringing that data back. We have one payload on IM-1 that doesn't remain attached, and that's the Eagle Cam from Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University, it actually ejects during terminal descent. And it's a camera pod that is gonna image the descent from a third person perspective. And then we'll telemeter that back wow. over and bring it back. We'll actually be able to have um, a video of the vehicle landing uh, from a third person. Oh my gosh, Tim, that's incredible. I was just thinking too, while you were saying that, for what I'm blown away by that statement, that's just going to be incredible to see the descent from from that. But I, also, even your website, you've got some tremendous animations. You're talking about that. There's some great animations. I'm going to, again, encourage our audience to go to your website and watch some of these amazing videos you've come up with. Um, and it must, again, be inspirational as you, uh, you're you right there in Houston. So you're seeing all kinds of history before you, and you're making this fantastic move. So I'm excited about the I Am One mission. Do you have a, a timeline for roughly when you think that'll go up? Yeah, we're, we're targeting June right now. Nice. We're, we're into some final tests. Uh, we're at the stage where um, our readiness, SpaceX's availability, the range, you know, where the moon is in the sky, all those things are converging to the final date. But we're pushing hard for uh, the June date. 
And again, this is just one of your amazing missions. Are you at liberty to tell us a little bit more about what else is coming up? Yeah, absolutely. So um, towards the end of the year, we'll have our second mission, uh, IM2, which is in a way quite a bit more sophisticated than IM1. IM2 is going to land uh, very much closer to the South Pole. And there are three primary payloads. There's a number of payloads on the mission, but the three primary primary payloads. One, we have the Prime 1 drill, which is the same drill that the Viper mission uh, is going to fly on, on the land, the Viper land uh, rover, sorry, Viper rover. Mm -hmm. It's going to drill and examine the tailings from the, the drill for volatiles and for, for organic compounds such as water. So, uh, or compounds such as water. So we'll basically drill and evaluate that drill and see if there's water ice just below the surface where we land. The other major payload is a Nokia experiment where they're going to demonstrate 4G communications on a lunar outpost rover, which will roll away from the lander and then demonstrate point-to-point -point 4G LTE communications on the surface. That's exciting because our third major payload is the Micronova Hopper, which is a vacuum power, a vacuum rocket drone. It's our take on the Ingenuity helicopter uh, that JPL has been so successful with at Mars. Mm -hmm. And so uh, we couldn't build a helicopter, so we built a rocket powered drone instead. That will launch off a rail system and then it will hop away from the Nova Sea on IM2 and then hop into a permanently shadowed region and take the first direct measurements of a permanently shadowed crater uh, of the moon and then hop back out. Wow. It will also use that 4G communication, so we'll actually have a 4G mesh network in operation on the surface of the moon. Right? So that's wow. all of the pieces that are operating on the, on the lander. The other thing that we're doing on the IM2 mission is we have a communications satellite, which we're deploying as a ride share on that same mission. And it will uh, go out with us along with the lander, but it does not have the same sporty methane engine that we have on the lander. So it'll actually take 90 days to circle back around and to get it in orbit. But that satellite is called CON1, uh, K-H-O-N, for the, the Greek, uh, not Greek, Egyptian god of dreamers and travelers by moonlight. So CON1 will go up on IM2. And IM3 is going to launch in early 23, 24. This is 23 now. Uh, IM3 launches in early 24. And that's a mid-latitude region uh, lander. So it will land at a location called Reiner Gamma, which is the locale of a magnetic swirl anomaly that scientists have puzzled over for some time. And we're taking a number of rovers and magnetometers, which are going to investigate that magnetic anomaly and then try to characterize and map and provide the scientific community with uh, further data on exactly what's going on there. How did it form? Uh, and then on that mission, we're taking CON2, which will be our second COM relay set. And we're able to run. So. Oh, Tim, these are incredible missions. I, I'm, I'm just, I, I cannot wait. Uh, again, hopefully uh, I am one uh, in June. We're keeping our fingers crossed for that one and the others. Uh, one thing too, I, I just one one last note. I have to bring up this personal because I thought it was was kind of neat. Is that again, engineers very detailed, but also have that creative side. I understand for you that involves playing some bass guitar. Can you tell us a little bit more about your personal interest there? Yeah, absolutely. I uh, I when I moved to uh, Houston from uh, graduate school, I, I played a little bit of six string guitar, and I got in a group of, of other engineers, and we had a little band but I was the third best guitarist in the group. And uh, my dad had played bass uh, when he was younger and he let me borrow his bass. So I, I slipped into the starting lineup, if you will, by, by switching from six strings to four strings. <laughs> um, and then we, we played for a little bit and then I, I got to a, a group with, um, one of the guys is, uh, is the one of the lead for Ascent uh, um, trajectory optimization at NASA now. And the other guy is uh, one of the leaders in, in precision landing on the NASA side. And so the three of us had a little band and we played for about 10 years there and uh, really enjoyed playing bass. And, uh, you know, that that mentality of, of working on a team and, and supporting other people and playing bass all kind of go together. And so you, if you were here in the office, you'd see the way I operate. You go, oh, yeah, he's a bass player. 
definitely <laughs> definitely not a lead singer. <laughs> that's okay that's awesome though uh, again tim i just want to congratulate you and intuitive machines on incredible successes yet to come it's been an amazing journey so far and we'll definitely keep an eye on on this so tim i want to just thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule to join me today really appreciate it awesome job it was great talking to you ad lunum your space journey well, I really enjoyed my conversation with Tim today, and I'm so excited about the I Am One mission. If you'd like to follow this mission, just go to the company's website at intuitivemachines.com. I want to thank Tim for joining me today. I want to thank you for joining me as well. Again, if you can do me a small favor and share this episode with a friend, I'd certainly appreciate it. Thanks for joining me. We'll see you next time. God bless.